welcome back students we are getting into a new lesson in this video lesson number 5 is what we are going to discuss in lesson number 4 which was about moving charges and magnetism we talked about magnetism but we talked about magnetism from the perspective from the viewpoint of the moving charges the current current produced a magnetic field and we talked about that magnetic field in terms of the current that produced the magnetic field but in this lesson which is about magnetism and matter we would not be focusing so much on the current that is producing the magnetic field we wouldn't be focusing on the cause of this magnetic field we would be focusing on the magnetic field in general and we'd also talk about why different materials behave differently to a magnetic field some materials are attracted by the magnetic fields and some materials are repelled slightly by the magnetic fields and some materials become magnets in their own right and why this difference and what are these materials and that is something that we we'll talk about later in this lesson if you look at it our conscious exposure to magnetism is through a toy magnet it could be a bar magnet or a, a fridge magnet which you stick on your refrigerators or um, or uh, if you're really naughty and if you've broken a radio or something then you can get a there's the speaker magnets so this is how almost all of us get exposed to magnetism when we are young but if you think about it magnetism is always around us and it is not just one magnetic field we are subjected to a variety of magnetic fields the light that falls on me is an example of that because light is an electromagnetic radiation the very fact that you are able to see me now should tell you that i am being subjected to the magnetism of light and so is everything around me the wall the switch and the board and even the air molecules my spectacles my shirt and everything is subjected to magnetism and it is not just light even your cell phone signals your radio signals these also cause magnetism they could be fleeting but but there is there is this magnetism you are subjected to a wide variety of magnetism but our exposure to magnetism as a conscious phenomenon okay which you can see and feel is only through as i said the bar magnets or the fridge magnets and stuff like that these magnets you see have two poles the north and the south so you call them as magnetic dipoles everything that you see as a magnet is always a magnetic dipole this is in contrast with the electric field in electricity you have electric monopoles you have a take a proton that's a monopole and you take an electron that's a monopole you can separate them but you can never separate a north pole and a south pole you take a magnet you cut it into two pieces you don't get a north pole and a south pole separately you have two magnets with north and south poles with them individually it's always always a magnetic dipole that we come across in life magnetic monopoles as long as far as we know do not exist if you can find one 
and you can get an overprice. So the magnets that you come across have two general properties. The first one is the attractive property. You take a magnet, you bring a nail near it in the vicinity of the, magnetic, the magnet, then it gets attracted towards the magnet. The magnets can also repel each other, but again, if you bring North Pole to North, uh, North Pole, near a North Pole, then it's going to, to be reflected. This magnet is going to be, refle uh, to be repelled sorry, by the, uh, the other uh, magnet. That can also happen. But you call this as the attractive property of the magnet. As you bring a nail or an iron filings or something else, then it gets attracted to the magnet. So you call this as the attractive property of the magnet. And there is another property called as the directional property of the magnet. If I freely suspend a board magnet, then one of the tips would be pointing towards the geographic north and the other tip would be pointing towards the geographic south. So the tip that is pointing towards the geographic north is called as the north pole of this magnet. And then the tip that is pointing towards the, south, the geographic south pole is called as the magnetic south pole of the magnet. This directional property has been exploited by human beings for a very long time, particularly the Chinese. You can build a magnetic compass with magnets. They will tell you the direction. And this was used more by the sailors in the olden days. Because if you are voyaging through an ocean and it's night, yeah, you will still be able to say the directions based on the stars that you see. But suppose it's cloudy on that particular night. Then you have nothing to look at to know the direction. Everything that you see around you is water. Then how do you tell in which direction that you are moving? If you take a magnet and if you suspend it freely, then the North Pole will point to the North the geographic north. And this way you can know the directions. And what the, the sailors were using this property for a very long time. And so were the people who were moving through deserts. If you need to travel through desert, if you're a if you're a merchant, if you're a, if you have long distance business interests in those days. Okay. And then you need to, to navigate through the desert where you see nothing but you know, desert sands and stuff like that. There's nothing to tell you which direction you are going in. In that case, if you have a magnet, then again that tells you in which direction that you are going. So the directional property of a magnet has been exploited by people for a very long time, particularly the merchants and the sailors. And sailors would usually be merchants too. I mean, why would you even travel in the ocean if you have something to, if you don't have something to gain? Uh, so these two properties are very important properties of a magnet. And we also draw magnetic field lines. Do they really exist? No, they don't really exist. The field lines don't exist. It's just a convenience for you. The field lines are nothing but pointers to directions in which a magnetic, a small magnetic compass will move. 
you have a magnet you bring a magnetic compass in the vicinity of that magnet and then the magnetic compass will align with this magnetic field and the direction in which this magnetic compass aligns with this magnetic field is what gives rise to the magnetic field lines if i if i keep the compass at this point it's going to align in certain direction if i keep it in another point then it will align in another direction so then i, I start drawing lines the magnetic field lines form always form closed loops again this is in contrast with the electric field lines the electric field lines do not form closed loops the electric field lines start from the positive charge and end at the negative charge or they can escape to infinity or they can originate from infinity and then end at the negative charge they don't form closed loops but the magnetic field lines will form closed loops they will start from the north pole of the magnet and then come back to the south pole of the magnet and into the magnet they'll go enter the north pole again so the magnetic field lines form closed loops and if you draw a tangent at every point on these magnetic field lines then the the tang the tangent gives you the direction of the magnetic compass at that point this is this is something that you even come across in your 10th standard this magnetic field lines you have a magnet then you have a glass plate and then you you know sprinkle uh, iron filings then the iron filings orient themselves in certain directions and when you look at the way that they have arranged themselves tells you the presence of the magnetic field lines so with this introduction let's get into this lesson deeply now so what you have here are two fields produced by dipoles but one is a magnetic dipole and the other one is the electric dipole so this is the magnetic field and this is the electric field and these are magnetic field lines and these are electric field lines you can see that in the case of magnetic dipole which is nothing but a magnet in this case a bar magnet like this and you see the white dot here and that tells you this is a north pole and this is a south pole this dot identifies the north pole so you have a bar magnet like this and if you see this from the north pole the magnetic field lines emanate and they enter into the south pole and inside the magnet they go from the south pole to the north pole so they form closed loops but you can say the same thing about electric field lines the electric field lines start from the positive charge and they end at the negative charge or they start at the positive charge and they end at infinity again here the the field line starts at infinity and ends at negative charge so you can see that they do not form closed loops see here the line starts from the positive charge and it ends at negative charge and there is a line here but it doesn't form a closed loop you notice that it is in the opposite direction there is no line that goes from the negative charge to the positive charge the line the electric field line always goes from the positive charge to the negative charge so the electric field lines do not form closed loops but magnetic field lines do form 
क्लोज लूप अगर दैन इज फंडामेंटल डिफरेंस बिटवीन द मैग्नेटिक फील्ड लाइन एंड द इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड लाइन प्रति मच एवरीथिंग एल्स इज सिमिलर You can see that that if the lines are close to that they're crowded there, then the the magnetic field will be strong here. But as you, which means that like if you have a larger number of field lines per unit area, then at that space at that place, the field must be stronger. And as you go away, then for the same unit area. and you have less and less number of lines so the field becomes weaker and weaker the same is a case here at this position there are more number of lines per unit area as you go away for the same unit area you will have less number of lines so the field becomes weaker and the third point is this if i want to find the magnetic field direction at any point in space then i just need to take this curve and draw a tangent to this curve at that point and the direction of the tangent will give us the magnetic field direction which is the same for the electric field too and the fourth point is that the magnetic field lines do not form do not cross each other they don't cross the electric field lines also do not cross each other the reason as we discussed in the electricity chapter if the field lines cross then you cannot assign a unique direction at the point where the field lines cross so that is in violation of reality in reality at every point you will have a unique direction in which the magnetic compass will move so we conclude that the magnetic lines do not cross in the previous lesson we talked about infinitely long solenoid or a solenoid whose uh, whose cross sectional dimension um is negligible compared to the to the length so ideally if you take an ideal solenoid it's an infinitely long solenoid and we said that there is magnetic field inside the solenoid and there is no magnetic field outside the infinitely long solenoid but if you take a a finite solenoid a solenoid of a certain length a finite length then the field lines of the finite solenoid resemble the field lines of a bar magnet a solenoid like this a, so a solenoid of of this length probably will resemble the bar magnet this length depending on the other things but you uh, know in, in a larger sense a solenoid of finite length resembles a a bar magnet if i cut this bar magnet into two then it will form two smaller magnets of weaker strength likewise if i take a solenoid of finite length and cut it into two then that will also behave like two solenoids of weaker field strength it's pretty much similar the solenoid is pretty much similar to a bar magnet you can see that quali qualitatively and we'll get to do it quantitatively and now we'll talk about the parallel between the bar magnet and a finite solenoid and before we talk about that i want to draw your attention uh, to three things okay the first one is a magnetic field produced by a current carrying loop at a point along the axis of that loop we said if 
this is a loop that carries current i and uh, if this is radius k and then at a distance r from the center of the loop we want to find the magnetic field at this point p then b at this point is given by mu not i a square divided by 2 to r square plus a square the whole power 3 by 2. So this is what we derived in the previous lesson and that is for one loop and if this has multiple loops they are closely bound then the field produced by that coil of multiple loops which are closely wound so that there is no difference between the first one and the last one then the B was given by this expression N being the number of turns into mu naught i a square divided by 2 into r square plus a square to the power 3 by 2. And there was a third thing that we talked about that was the magnetic dipole moment m. It was given by n into i into a. n being the number of turns and i being the current through the coil and a being the area enclosed by the coil, by the loop. So we are going to use these, these three things when we try to establish the equivalence between a bar magnet and a finite solenoid. Okay? Let me consider a finite solenoid. Okay, I am going to draw it like this. I am not drawn the turns on the solenoid, but you can imagine it. So this is this is a solenoid. You can imagine turns there. There are multiple turns in the solenoid. And let me take the middle of the solenoid and I call it as my origin. And this is the axis of the solenoid. And let me choose a point P along the axis. And I'm going to find the magnetic field B at this point P. And this point P is at a distance R from the origin. And let's say the length or rather the half length of the solenoid from, uh, from this origin, this is L and on this side too we have L. Let's say that the total length of the solenoid now is 2L. But from the center we have length L on the left, right side and length L on the left side. So total is 2L. And let us suppose that N, capital N, being the number of turns in the solenoid, the total number of turns is this n. So, total number of turns. Okay. But this, there are n turns over a length of 2L meters. So, the number of turns per unit length is given by this expression. So, this n is actually the number of turns per unit length. And this is given by capital N total number of turns divided by 2 to n. So that's your n.
Okay? Now, let me take a portion of this, a small length of this solenoid at a distance x from the origin. Let me take it here. So this portion I am interested in that is at a distance x from the origin and this length is a very small length so I call it as dx. So at a distance x I take a very small length of the solenoid. So you have turns in that length. It's a very small length but then you have turns in that length. Okay. Now, this is going back like a, a coil, like this, a loop, but then a few closely wound turns in that small length, okay? So this length of the solenoid will have certain number of turns and all of them will produce a field here. Likewise, there could be many DLs in this solenoid. I can have a DL here too, or rather DX. I can have a small length here. Another DX. This will also produce a field there. And any other DX in the solenoid will produce its own field there. So the total field is the sum of all these small fields produced by these small lengths. But the field produced by this one is not going to be the same as the field produced by this one. Why? This is closer to the point P than this is. So the field value due to this one would be greater than the field value due to this one. So every other dx length of the solenoid will produce a different value of the field at this point P. So the net field would be the sum of all these little fields. And I have to go for integration because I have many different lengths which produce differing, differing fields at this. So the total field, the total the final value B would be the sum of all these individual fields that are put in by these small lengths of the solenoid. So let me just take dB. Let me take this one. This is my dx. I'm not going to focus on this, but let me just focus on this dx. Okay. So what is the number of turns in this small length dx? Well, you know that the total the number of turns per unit length is n. So and then you are going to take dx length. So the number of turns in this dx length will be n dx. So the number of turns in this length is going to be n dx is the number of length. Now number of turns in this in that length. So this would put a field there. So that I'll call as db. So my db is equal to mu naught into i into number of turns. Like n into i, right? Into i so now you have n dx, it's small n and then dx. And this is the radius a of the solenoid. So a squared divided by 2. Now I need to find the distance from this coil this section of the solenoid to this point. That is not R. R is from the center. And this length from this coil to that one would be R minus 6 because this is at a distance x from, from the origin, from the, from the center. So that's going to be R minus x the whole square plus a square the whole power 3 by 2. Okay. Now, all the 
all the other dx's. We will put their own fields. So now I need to go for integration. So my b, final b, is equal to integral d. Okay? And that is going to be equal to mu naught i n a squared dx divided by 2 to r minus x whole square plus a square by 3 by 2. This is integral. What are, the, what are the limits of this integral? We are going to start from here and end here. So this is minus L. This is the center. So we are going to start from minus L and this is L plus L. So the limits of integration would be minus L to plus L. And let me see what I can take out, the, the constants, right? So let me try to take constants out. What are the constants here? Mu naught is a constant, i is a constant again, and n is a constant, a squared is a constant, and 2 is a constant, and uh, let's see, here, minus l, l, and then dx, by r minus x the whole square square plus a square the whole power 3 by 2. x is varying, so you have to have it here. So if I have this expression, if I can integrate it, then I can find the value of b for any distance r from this place. If I do it using Techniques of integral calculus. But I don't have to, you can say it's a little complex for you now. It's not, you can do it once you've, once you've been taught how to do calculus, uh, the integration, in your calculus part of the syllabus, then it's easier for you, it's easy for you to do. But you don't have to worry too much about it now because I'm going to have some, some kind of a, uh, I'm going to have a smart approximation here. Yeah. Let me take this point P to be far off. Okay? The point is on the axis, but then it is little far off. It is the dis the R is so big that L is too small. The length is very small. And also the radius is small. So, if this is if this is a bar magnet, it's a bar magnet, I'm going to, my R is somewhere there so that the radius and also the length become negligible. Then, I can manipulate this. The condition here is R is much greater than L and also R is much greater than A. If I choose a point like that, if I choose a, if my R is that, my R is so big that I can ignore L and A, then this reduces to something else. Notice it. So what happens is, if my R is big, then R minus X is still R. If A is small, if A also can be ignored, then this can be this can be ignored and this can be ignored, then the whole thing will become r squared power 3 by 2. So the two and this two will cancel and finally you are going to be left with mu naught i n a squared by 2. And if I'm going to get r cube here because of this condition, this is 0, this is 0, then I can ignore them. Then this will become R Q and minus L to L dx. It's a very easy integral. So this gives you u naught i n a square by 2 R Q 
and then x, the lower limit of minus n and the upper limit of l. So when I substitute that, l minus of minus l. So l plus l, I get 2 l. So that gives me mu naught i n a square by 2 or q into 2l. This part becomes 2l. Okay. From this equation, you see if it bring 2l here, n into 2l will give me capital N, which is the total number of terms. So this n and this 2l will give me the total number of terms in the finite solenoid. So that makes me have this mu naught i n a squared by 2 of q. I'm going to go for further manipulation. I've got a squared, but if I multiply this by pi and divide that by pi, then I have pi a squared. Pi a squared is nothing but area enclosed by the loop. So then I can use this expression. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply that by pi, divide that by pi. So that gives me mu naught n i and this is a pi a squared divided by 2 pi r q. So that becomes m. So this gives me mu naught n i a is m, the magnetic dipole moment of the solenoid divided by 2 pi r q. And another manipulation is another manipulation is you multiply this by 2 and then divide this by 2 and that gives you mu naught 2m divided by 4 pi r q. So my b here is equal to mu naught 2m by 4 pi r q. So this is a magnetic field I have at the point P if it is far off on the axis of the solenoid, the finite solenoid. This is a theoretical result and this matches with the experimental result of a Bohr magnet. If you take a Bohr magnet and if you find P at a far off place of the Bohr magnet, it matches with this expression. We have already seen that the magnetic field is similar in the case of a Bohr magnet and also a solenoid. And the magnetic field value is same in the case of a Bohr magnet and also a solenoid. So we can say that these two are equivalent. So a Bohr magnet can be considered As, a, as an equivalent of a, a solenoid. The other thing here is that finding the magnetic moment of the Bohr magnet. You know, you don't have, when you have no idea what current is flowing through the Bohr magnet. If it's a solenoid, then you know the current value and all that stuff. But if it's a Bohr magnet, you don't have current flowing through it. Or I mean, you can measure it at least. Um, so, how do you find the magnetic dipole moment of a Bohr magnet? It is done like this. You take a Bohr magnet and you take a point and this Bohr magnet is going to produce a, a certain magnetic field strength at that point, a far off point. Now you take a solenoid and if this solenoid produces the same magnetic field at that point, then the magnetic dipole moment of the Bohr magnet is the magnetic dipole moment of the solenoid. This you can easily calculate, NIA, that's the 
mag magnet dipole moment of the solenoid and that would be the magnetic dipole moment of the bar magnet because they are equivalent if you produce the same field if the solenoid produces the same field as the bar magnet then they are equivalent so the magnetic dipole moment of the bar magnet must be the same as a magnetic dipole moment of the solenoid hope this is clear to you in all our discussions so far we define the magnetic dipole moment as m is equal to n i a n is a number of turns and i is a current flowing through those turns and a is area of the turn but some people take a different approach they try to define the magnetic dipole moment the same way we define the electric dipole moment what did we do when we define the electric dipole moment the electric dipole consists of the positive charge plus q and the negative charge minus q separated by a distance 2l so the electric dipole moment was q multiplied by 2l likewise if you have a magnetic charge then the north pole will have a positive magnetic charge and you can assign a negative magnetic charge to the south pole they don't call it magnetic charge but they call it pole strength and if these poles are separated by a distance to l then this pole strength is nothing but the magnetic charge multiplied by this distance to l will give you the magnetic dipole moment but most books do not take this approach the reason is that it is okay to do it in the case of electric dipoles because you have electric monopoles the positive charge and then the negative charge but you don't have magnetic monopoles you can separate the north pole and the south pole they always come in pairs so we do not take that approach we define the magnetic dipole moment as m is equal to n i a not as the pole strength multiplied by the distance i want you to remember this most standard books don't define the magnetic dipole moment in terms of the, of the pole strength they define it from the perspective of a current equivalent